By now, you've probably figured out some things about me. You've probably guessed that my Indian parents pushed me. <laughs> not only did they push me to skip several grades, they pushed me to not have friends or a social life or even sleepovers. I was probably on a regimented intellectual diet of advanced math and SAT test prep from age two. And as a result, I don't do anything for my own personal interests. It's all for the grades, the salary, and the eventual success. But the worst part of all this is because I've been raised this way my entire life, I probably am, incap am incapable of relating to another human being or just to be an emotionally whole person. And after all of this, there are probably still some of you in the audience who are wondering how you can get your kid into college at the age of 14. <laughs> the good news is I'm here to tell you. The bad news is it might not be what you think it is. This is the first time I've ever accepted an opportunity to talk about my age, and I decided to give it a try because over the past few years, I've talked to so many people who think that I am where I am today because of intelligence that I was born with. And over the next few minutes, I hope to prove them wrong. <laughs> the truth is, until very recently, until I got into college, most people who knew my family thought my brother and I spent way too much time playing outside and having fun and not enough time studying. So where did this all start? Well, my parents actually never planned for me to go to college at 14. Turns out, I was a kindergarten school dropout. <laughs> and during the first three months of kindergarten, I was doing great. I grew up loving stories and books, so my mother taught me how to read at home. And one of my favorite things to do growing up was to read on my own, so it seemed natural that I would do well in alphabet lessons at school until one day when my mother started getting notes sent home from the teacher, and most of them read something like, your daughter is falling behind, she needs to work on her letter recognition. Rather than talking to me, my mother decided to volunteer in class one day to see what was actually going on. She was shocked to see when the teacher asked us all to write an A, I took so much effort to write the perfect C. <laughs> she waited until class was over, pulled me aside, and asked me what I was doing. Now, I don't remember this, but apparently I said something along the lines of, well, back when I knew everything, I didn't have any friends, and now that I don't know anything, I have so many friends, and I'm invited to birthday parties every weekend. <laughs> I figured it out, and this is how it's going to be. <laughs> Needless to say, my parents were more than a little unsettled. At the age of four, I decided what was important to me, and it definitely wasn't performing well in school. So they started looking for alternate educational opportunities for me and decided to homeschool me. It started out as a one-year experiment and turned into a 10-year experiment. By the end of it, I would had the benefit of getting an incredibly customized education. And I learned from doing research, from taking college courses, from teaching myself, from playing outdoors and traveling. But that was supposedly my academic portion of the education. A big part of my education was actually learning how to be authentic to myself, regardless of the social situation that I was in. And I'm not saying that no one in this audience has ever thought about authenticity. I'm sure all of us can actually think of a time where we are figuring out what to do with our lives or where we fit into the rest of the world. But I'm 18 and I'm suffering from teenage angst, so I'd like to think that my story was a little bit different in one main way. Very early on, I realized that we grow up believing in rules that determine who we have conversations with and who we have friends with. And to me, that also meant that we grew up believing that when we're a certain age, we feel like we can only relate to other people who are born in the same year, regardless of backgrounds, personalities, interests, worldviews, or senses of humor. So when I was 13, my typical day would look something like this. I'd wake up in the morning, do some work, and head to local community college to take a chemistry class. On the way to class, I'd see my friend who was late in turning in a problem set, sit down with him, talk about chemistry, talk about life, and after class, head to the lab to do some research. I'd get home to play kickball with my 10-year-old neighbors, and then came the best part of my day. I was ready for my first tennis lessons. I walked onto the court, brand new racket in hand, and saw that the instructor of my class was the same friend that I was helping with a problem set earlier that day. Now, situations like this popped up in my life, so many times. I learned quickly, and by the time I got to Stanford, I realized that being the same age, or being the same anything, wasn't a prerequisite to being friends with someone. 
Another thing that I feel like people don't often see in the story is how many times I tried to break the rules, but also how many times I tried, period. Growing up, I always wanted to be an animal scientist. And by the time I was 12, I'd conducted two years of research and decided I was interested in molecular biology. So I wanted to work in a lab. The problem is, when you're 12, it's not even legal to work in most labs. <laughs> and most college professors would rather work with college students than with you. So I looked up every scientist that did work that I was interested in within a 100-mile radius of where I lived and sent emails to them. And it would usually go something like this. I find a really exciting professor, send off an email, and never hear back. Over the course of seven months, I sent so many emails to all these different professors, and most never responded. A couple responded with a polite no, but a few invited me to come talk to them. I went in to talk to one of the professors, and it turns out he had actually misunderstood my email, and it was a complete accident that he had even asked me to come talk to him. <laughs> but by the end of our conversation, he saw how much I cared, and he was willing to give me a chance. That year, I ended up conducting research in his lab and learned more than I ever could have in a classroom. It was also towards the beginning of seven years, during which I conducted research, asked really interesting questions, and worked with amazing people, and eventually ended up getting international recognition for my work. But none of it would have ever happened had I not tried over and over and over again. In the end, I think my story is not at all about how to get to college at 14. It was more about how to get out of my own way, how to see barriers that I thought existed and then ignore them. Age is no longer my narrative. I'm 18 and I can sign my own forms now. <laughs> really exciting. <laughs> and the truth is, in a few years, it won't even matter that I went to college early. The thing is, I was born into a family that is absolutely amazing, and I had access to educational opportunities and scholarships that let me do all the things that I learned. Customizing my own learning experience and being authentic while breaking rules. I can easily see how different my experience would have turned out had I not had access to even one of those things. I've come to realize that I'm perceived as being intelligent because I've had access to opportunities that other people haven't. I believe that I have the capacity to create incredible change in this world, as does every other person on this planet. But in order for us to do that, we first need to be thinking very critically about how we perceive, measure, and define intelligence. Thank you.